Today on Pathways to Wellbeing, Dr. Elizabeth Mumper joins us to talk about the pediatric microbiome, discussing the latest research, clinical tools and insights, and strategies for building healthy adults. We really think that if we can spend the first two years of a child's life giving them really good gut flora, and more importantly, not damaging their gut flora, that that sets them up for much less chronic illness as they're older and a much healthier and uh, happier life. Dr. Liz Mumper is the president and CEO of the Rimlin Center for Integrative Medicine in Lynchburg, Virginia which provides personalized pediatric care for children with neurodevelopmental problems. Her general practice is Advocates for Children Pediatrics, and another part of her practice, Advocates for Families, is devoted to the care of children with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions and their family. Welcome, Dr. Mumper. We're delighted to talk with you today on the podcast. I've heard you speak before about a rising tide in medicine and how more and more health professionals are recognizing the need for a paradigm shift that really focuses on an integrative and whole person approach. As a parent and a physician, I'd love to learn more about how a dysbiotic pediatric gut potentially impacts things like immunity, susceptibility to disease and health recovery, and certainly resiliency, which has been a big topic of conversation in 2020. So I'm hoping we can begin our conversation today talking about the relationship between gut dysbiosis and the development of chronic disease in pediatric patients. How do you believe that the functional medicine model is particularly well suited to address the needs of this population? Well, fortunately, children are usually pretty resilient. So I think that if we get out of their way sometimes, that is probably our most important job. For example, we know we've done a lot of harm by overusing antibiotics, and I'm very concerned that many babies get uh, either proton pump inhibitors or antacids for what is probably just physiologic reflux that they will grow out of. Um, both of those things have really significant downstream effects on the gut. So in our practice, we're very aware that a good immune system begins in the gut and that the first thousand days of life are really important for establishing a good gut flora and developing oral tolerance. So when we get a new baby in our practice, we look at historical risk factors that put that very precious microbiome at risk. Things like being born by C-section, or having uh, antibiotics during delivery because the mother was group B uh, positive, or if the mother isn't able to breastfeed and so the baby is deprived of those lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that are such a good foundation for a robust gut flora. So we know that chronic inflammation is very much tied to uh, deficiencies in the microbiome. One of the disadvantages of our industrialized society is that it has affected our gut microbiome. We're essentially suffering from an epidemic of absence, as uh, one of the authors of a wonderful book uh, uh, that is by Manoff talked about. So we don't have as much vitamin D as we used to because we're not outside as much and we're working inside and on computers. Um, we're under this sort of chronic stress of day-to-day -day busyness of life, which is very different from the past where, you know, uh, we had these punctuating times where we were under stress, but it wasn't unrelenting. And then we're not being exposed to as many natural uh, beetles and parasites as we once were. And one of the effects of that is that we end up being more prone to things like autoimmune disease or chronic inflammation. So I'm really passionate about looking at this first 1,000 days of life as a really sacred time and really trying to look at how not to hurt that emerging microbiome. That's a big part of what we do in our practice is to try to nurture and protect that. So one great way to do that is to support breastfeeding so that your 
parents in your practice have access to lactation educators uh, so that they can hopefully breastfeed for a year or longer, which is one of the best ways to give the child a really good start with a really good set of gut flora. That's brilliant. I love how you spoke about the first 1,000 days because this really ties into the functional medicine timeline and how we really need to be aware of those uh, both prenatal and early childhood factors. There's so many aspects of the timeline that can impact the development of chronic disease moving forward. So that's a very stark example, and I think that's a, a brilliant way to lead into how these markers on our timeline, like I said, can predispose us to health outcomes later. What are some clues of gut dysfunction in a child? What can we look for uh, and, and correlate back to the timeline of what might have happened? And can those clues that you're looking for include things like behavioral or neurodevelopmental issues? Yeah, that's actually quite true. So it's really important to take a good history. Um, one of the adages in pediatrics is that if you take a careful history, the parent or the baby or the child will be able to direct you to the diagnosis over 90% of the time. So I'm concerned about things like C-sections, lack of breastfeeding, getting antibiotics early. And I'm also concerned about getting hepatitis B at birth because that vaccine has grown in a yeast protein, and I'm concerned about the potential to dysregulate the emerging gut flora. So when we have babies in our practice that have those risk factors, we look early on at doing things like infant probiotics. Now, um, you can look at stooling patterns to get some clues about dysbiosis, and probably one of the best clues is that if the baby has very foul-smelling stools, uh, stools of breastfed babies are actually not foul smelling at all. So if you have a formula fed baby, the, the odors are going to change. But when they're very foul, that makes us think that there may be some uh, gut bacteria that are fermenting or otherwise creating metabolic products to make the, the foul smell. But one of the things that's hard to figure out when you're looking for gut disease in young children is that since they can't really talk, you have to look at all kinds of physical exam clues and behavioral clues to see when they're having a problem. So for example, you know, a classic sign might be a child holding their belly, but um, a lot of times we'll see children who drape themselves over the end of a sofa or push themselves up to the edge of, the, of a coffee table so that they can put pressure on their belly to relieve their pain. Sometimes they'll just be real irritable. Sometimes they'll have trouble falling asleep at night, especially if they have reflux problems. Sometimes with reflux, you'll see them pushing on their chin, which is an interesting sign that I don't think we really think about when we're doing adult med. Uh, medicine, and then um, the issues of the behavioral changes. So one of the things that's been most interesting to me working with a population that includes a lot of kids with autism is the fact that we now have a bunch of clear scientific evidence about the way that gut pain uh, can affect people's behavior and immune dysregulation can affect children's behavior. So for example, one of the abnormalities we often see in children on the autism spectrum is that they have some abnormalities in something called tumor necrosis factor beta. And this work was done by the folks at UC Davis. And they were able to directly show that different levels of tumor necrosis factor beta correlated with either positive behaviors or negative dysregulated behaviors. Um, we also know that things such as um, allergy spikes will affect children's behavior. So a doctor named Dr. Boris, who was a pediatric immunologist many years ago, did a wonderful study where he looked at his children with ADHD, and he also did the same thing with children with autism. And he was able to show this very tight correlation between the children who were um, starting to have difficulty with needing their ADHD meds changed or having more difficult behaviors if they were on the autism spectrum when the pollen count was spiking and the strike the uh, charts were quite striking in themselves. So we definitely know that there's this very big communication between the immune system and the brain and that what's happening in the gut 
influences the brain. This is a, another perfect example of kind of our functional medicine model and nodes of the matrix, right? As you're talking, I'm kind of picking up assimilation and digestion, defense and repair, communication, and how all of these nodes are working together. And we need to support all of them, many of them in combination. So uh, when I'm working with adult patients and I'm suspecting that there's gut microbiome imbalance or dysbiosis, I'm often doing comprehensive stool analysis. But I imagine that's not uh, maybe as common in the pediatric population. So I'm hoping to get a little insight from you about you know, what's your initial assessment step if you suspect that there's some gut dysfunction happening in a, in a pediatric patient? Well, if I can um, get some sense just from the history in infancy, that's helpful because the, our microbiome changes as we age. And in infancy, the normal microbiome classically has a lot of strains of lactobacillus and a lot of strains of bifidobacteria. And so sometimes we will empirically treat infants if they've had courses of antibiotics or if uh, they're starting to have eczema, which we view as a skin window into the immune system to see that there's a leaky gut probably. Um, we, in older children, will do CDSAs um, and that can be very helpful because it will let us look at the presence or absence of inflammation. It will let us look at the values of the fecal secretory IgA, which can be a very nice clue. And it will look at digestive factors too, so that we might be able to figure out if we need to give the child digestive enzymes um, in addition to probiotics. So yes, we do use CDSAs. There are labs where um, the norms don't really um, fit under the age of two. So sometimes we have to do our best but using clinical judgment and empiric interventions until the child reaches that age where we can um, send off those studies. That is the perfect lead in to my next question. So we know we need to do something and now we need to make a treatment. For pediatric patients, do you have some advice of giving a probiotic or prebiotic supplements versus trying to get those in food sources? Yeah, so, uh, you know, our approach is always that it's better to do it with food if you can. So when babies are very young, you are typically able to sort of train their taste buds. So, you know, if you have a parent that starts out giving the child, you know, sweetened Cheerios as soon as they can start handling some solid foods, then they're going to want to continue to get that. But if you've got parents like we do who start giving their kids sauerkraut when they're like nine months old or a little bit of pickle juice or, you know, a little sip of the mom's kombucha, then babies will very much adapt to that flavor. So in our practice, um, we do introduction of foods a little differently from um, what I was taught in my pediatric practice long ago, where we were taught to start with rice cereal. We like to start with avocado or uh, a vegetable like sweet potatoes or squash. And we want the baby to have at least three or four vegetables before they ever get the flavor of the sweeter fruits. And then we do like to introduce these uh, prebiotic foods early on. Um, we also use probiotics. Um, there are probiotics specifically made for infants, which has like six strains of lactobacillus and six strains of bifidobacteria. Then there are other probiotics that are formulated for toddlers and young children that are also pretty heavy on lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, but sometimes add in some other organisms such as certain probiotic strains that include a strep. Um, and then, you know, adult probiotics are a little bit different altogether. But in our practice, actually probiotics are our first treatment for constipation. Most people don't really think of that first off, but one of the things that probiotics do for children is to help uh, peristalsis, so help them move the stools through the gut so that they don't become constipated. We also really like the way that they make it harder for pathogens to adhere to the gut wall. And so on probiotics, they're not as likely to get a devastating gastrointestinal illness. And um, 
remember that probiotics also help us make really important vitamins. So um, we have a pretty low threshold for doing probiotics in infancy for those kids that are at risk because we really think that if we can spend the first two years of a child's life giving them really good gut flora and more importantly not damaging their gut flora that that sets them up for much less chronic illness as they're older and a much healthier and uh, happier life. Yeah, you've, you've definitely highlighted several supplement, dietary, lifestyle interventions that we can take to set children up for, for success, for health into adulthood. What advice do you have when collaborating with parents on implementing these therapeutic treatments when there needs to be a diet change or adding a supplement? How do we uh, encourage sustainability of these interventions when maybe the whole family might need to get involved to make it work? So we definitely have to meet parents where they are. And um, w the longer we do this, the more we just keep asking for feedback. And we say things like, if I told you that I thought it would really help your child's behavior if you went gluten-free, is that something that you would consider doing? And you'll either get the answer of yes, whatever it takes, because the behavior is driving us nuts, or no, I grew up having a bagel every day for breakfast and a roll at dinner, and that would be really hard. So it's sort of an assessment of what their uh, goals are is really important. Um, for our first step, we typically just try to work on cleaning up the diet. So typically I won't immediately go to gluten-free, casein-free, mitochondrial specific, or you know whatever, uh, paleo, pegan, whatever we might be thinking about until we just get them to get rid of the junk. So we usually give a little speech about how um, humans weren't really designed with the enzymes to break down the preservatives that are in food now and how we've all been a part of this really big experiment over the last 50 to 100 years where our food's now coming from factories instead of from gardens and our first work is to get them to just give more vegetables and give less processed foods um, if we can get them to take away sugar and simple carbs that typically has a big effect on um, balancing their blood sugar. And that in itself often really improves their behavioral swings. And so we talk a lot with parents about the importance of giving proteins and good fats through the day so that the child's blood sugar is stabilized. Another important trick, I think, is to give them specific concrete examples of what you want them to feed their child. So it's a total mind shift between I want you to take out gluten and casein and anything that's processed and anything that comes in a box to this is what is going to really tell your child's cells what to do biochemically. You know, lots of fresh vegetables. Can you hit at least five a day? We'd love it if it was 10 a day. Um, you know, nutrient dense foods and good proteins and good fats like avocado and tree nuts. Um, if you do fruits, we like to really emphasize the ones that are very color dense because they have the most phytonutrients. And um, then try to cut back on uh, the carbs. So we often will print out recipes right in our notes for our patients. So when we have a complicated patient, a functional medicine patient, we very much believe in the whole concept of sharing the story with them and we share our notes. So we'll often cut and paste some recipes. Um, for example, a lot of kids want to have either cereal or a bagel or a donut for breakfast. And so we, for those families, we will print out our paleo muffin and paleo pancake recipe so that the child still feels like he's getting that kind of a treat, but it's full of good fats and good proteins instead. Um, we also use the analogy of eating a rainbow every day. IFM developed a nice handout about that. And um, kids in the two to five age range get very excited about this. And so we usually say things like, um, go home, write a rainbow, color it in, put it on the refrigerator, and then each day you can check off what colors you ate that day. And um, I tell them that every checkup from like two to seven and by seven, they're like, I know, eat a rainbow every day. So that works well. And parents can, um, parents can handle that. Um, 
I also would recommend building in social reinforcers for better eating behavior. So, you know, a lot of people um, will like give their kids M&Ms if they toilet train or if um, my autism patients are at ABA, one of the the reinforcers they love the most that drives me insane is they'll often give them Skittles, which have a lot of dyes in them. And so we say, you know, if you eat a rainbow every day for five days, then you get to go with your dad to the park. You know, those kinds of social reinforcers or you get extra screen time is a is a good bribe in the older kids. Um, and then in terms of giving supplements, the first step you have to do is find out if the kid needs a liquid or will take a chewable or can swallow a pill or a capsule because you have to give them something that they can do. And you don't wanna give the parents a power struggle if you can avoid it. So the unfortunate thing is that with some of our supplements that we use, um, the liquid forms of multivitamins, especially if they have relatively high B vitamin content, uh, don't taste very good at all. And so some parents are tempted to like put it in the child's favorite food. We actually discourage that, assuming that favorite food is something that's good for them because we don't want to ruin an otherwise nutritious food. So we take the attitude that this is medicine, you know, you swallow it down and then right after that you get something that you can wash it down with that, um, that you like. Um, sort of swallow first and then chase it uh, with another taste. So those are some of the things that we've um, found helpful. Is that kind of what you had in mind? That was perfect. So many uh, clinical pearls, practical advice in there. I love that you mentioned the phytonutrient spectrum checklist, that rainbow mm -hmm. handout. Uh, I use that with my kids all the time. And what I found is that it's actually really helpful for the adults too, mm -hmm. to say, oh, wow, we actually don't eat very many orange foods. And that's my responsibility now to get those from the grocery store so that we have that option. Yeah. So I, I love that you mentioned that. And I heard you talk about you know, we're not eating from gardens as often. Mm -hmm. So we're not having as many exposures to, you know, those potentially beneficial bacteria that would come from soil and organic gardens. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about the relationship between the pediatric microbiome and developing oral tolerance, the hygiene hypothesis that we love to talk about. And how does that impact allergy protection from childhood into adulthood? In our practice, we actually like to tell parents that their kids need to eat some dirt. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but it comes back to this idea of how we know from a bunch of different studies now that children who are raised on farms, who go out and feed the chickens, who have dogs lick them in the face when they're babies, that those kids are much less likely to have allergies and asthma later on. And there have been uh, some really huge studies in Europe looking at like 23,000 people where they were, were able to show that kids who got probiotics and attention to their gut uh, microbiome in the first two years of life or in pregnancy were about 50% less likely at the age of two to have either allergies or asthma. So those are all really big payoffs. And so I really regard this concept of oral tolerance as fundamental. So basically what that means is that in the first year of life, we have to teach a baby's immune system that just because something goes into their mouth doesn't mean that their immune system needs to panic and react to it. And so part of that is making sure that we don't have reason to have a leaky gut you know, even like a gastroenteritis in infancy can dysregulate the digestive enzymes for a while. Um, and chronic inflammation is going to make it more likely or especially chronic fungal infection that the child does have a leaky gut. So if that happens, we can do, you know, the four or five R steps to, to work on that. But we want babies to get nutrient dense foods and to not have their immune system react so much to things like peanuts or gluten or casein. So this has prompted a bit of a controversy about how we should feed kids in the first year of life. Um, 
it used to be that we would delay introduction of peanut because we thought that there were so many people having peanut allergies that that would make sense to avoid um, a bad reaction in a really young baby. But now the evidence suggests that we should give very small amounts so that they uh, are able to develop over time oral tolerance to that. It's also helpful if they can start gluten at a time when they're still breastfeeding. That seems to be very much protective against having problems with gluten later on. Um, we just know that it's not only the sort of infectious disease immune aspect of the gut flora, but there's also a whole metabolic aspect to it where our gut floras are influencing our behavior, um, it influences how we can metabolize our drugs. One of the examples is um, your ability to detoxify acetaminophen, uh, which is Tylenol or paracetamol for people from uh, Europe and Australia, uh, is very much dependent on how good your gut flora are at helping your body uh, metabolize that. So lots of good reasons to work hard on that. Um, it's important to realize that there are a lot of things that happen in public health that decrease the prevalence of infectious diseases. Um, things like having refrigerators and having, you know, sewage plants and uh, better sanitation practices, all those things. Um, that has decreased the amount of acute illness. But we've seen this sort of swap between we don't have as many acute childhood illnesses, but we have more chronic illness. And the very sad statistic is that more than 50% of American children now have at least one chronic disease. So this idea of, you know, doing a garden with your kids, letting them dig in the dirt, um, having a dog in the first year of life to lick your child, all those things sort of help you not react so badly with overdeveloping your TH2 immunity, the part of your immune system that gives you allergies and autoimmunity. And I think that in terms of doing really nutrient dense diets, it's really important to think about how that helps your innate immune system. So the innate immune system is sort of your first line defense. It's very nonspecific. It's gonna help you in a variety of situations as opposed to very specific targeted interventions um, that are, aren't as um, helpful in a global way. So does that make sense? That makes great sense. You've really highlighted, um, we, we talk all the time about the importance of, you know, fresh, healthy, whole foods, but I think you've really highlighted how that's actually very important for how your immune system is developing. And my question to you is, we've had so many conversations lately about access, right? Access to functional medicine, access to fresh fruits and healthy foods. When we consider potential barriers that our patients might be facing, whether that's you know financial, cultural, social, time constraints, all of that, do you have any clinical pearls of you know for practitioners how we counsel patients on overcoming some of those barriers to to have access to these treatments and interventions that you've highlighted for us? Yeah, it, it's really a very difficult situation because in pediatrics, in particular. Um, the insurance industry reimburses best for very short acute visits. And if you can do four or five short acute visits in an hour versus me spending an hour and a half with a patient, you know, literally um, it's three times the reimbursement if you're doing the short quick stuff. And so the incentives in a typical practice that is driven by the insurance industry is for in and out quickly, high volume. Um, the work we do is not quick and um, it takes some counseling. And so there are financial ba barriers and I feel terrible about that because I see my patients who have Medicaid and I would like to give them a probiotic, but sometimes the parents can't afford that. And um, Medicaid will pay for six or eight um, seizure medicines, <laughs> anti-inflammatories, prescription medicines for reflux, asthma medicines, allergy medicines, but they don't pay for things like probiotics or a good multivitamin. 
So we do have a very divided system in our country, and I think that's become even more clear over the last six months. So a couple ideas that we try to do, one is, um, if you can create smart text that explains concepts that you pull into your note, then you can send the patients home with that and you don't have to spend as much time in the office um, going over that, which, you know, is time and therefore costs money. Um, we do a, a very long intake form and we still sort of tell the story back to the patient, but by having all that information ahead of time, it allows me to sort of formulate my concept of the case. And then I go through and say, now I wanna clarify this point here, you know, uh, tell me more about this reaction or tell me more about the antibiotics that your child had. And then at the end of that, you tell the story back and say, what I see is a child that, you know, because of being born by a C-section um, and having a lot of ear infections in the first year of life, got a lot of antibiotics. And we, I think we really need to work on your baby's gut. We need to make it a high priority to give them probiotics or prebiotic foods. And parents understand that. It's very important that they feel like you understood their concerns. Um, so doing as much as you can with either written information that you give or using health coaches or nutritionists is very important. So I've had the same autism coordinator and nutritionist for 20 years now. And when we're in the room, she can sort of tell what I'm going to say before I say it to the parents. So I will often delegate it to her to do a lot of the nitty gritty counseling and, and patients really like specifics. So we will um, give specific brand recommendations in the room based on the particular patient. Again, some of that's depending on does the child need a liquid or a pill or can they do a capsule? But I think that's better than just sending them to the health food store and say, you know, pick out a vitamin D or, you know, pick out a probiotic. So um, food deserts are horrible. You know, I really lose sleep worrying about kids in the inner city that have all the socioeconomic challenges, um, sometimes racial challenges, and um, you know their access to food is the 7-Eleven. And, and um, I just watch their health get worse and worse over the years. And um, I, I wish we had a good solution for that. I know that there are a lot of good people in this country trying to really look at the whole idea of food as pharmacy and food as, you know, your medicine. Um, and I hope that they're successful because that is so fundamental. Yeah, I love how you always bring it back to the importance and the power of retelling the story just so that a patient can kind of understand how the events of their life or their child's life have influenced their health trajectory. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about the timeline and thinking about some common themes that you've talked about for how we can prevent chronic disease, I'm hearing uh, the birth, you know, the, the method of, of labor and delivery is one consideration. Access to lactation support and breastfeeding guidance, uh, maybe some microbial exposure, a diverse microbial exposure in early life, certainly phytonutrient density and diversity in the diet. In, those, in that early childhood part of the timeline, are there any other themes that we should be really aware of thinking about disease prevention into adulthood? Yeah, so those are all really good things. And to just take the breastfeeding a little bit farther, remember that if you were breastfed, you have less chance of getting inflammatory bowel disease, less chance of getting certain cancers, less chance of getting type 1 diabetes, less chance of having celiac disease. You're much less likely to have GI or respiratory illness that lands you in the hospital, and you're less likely to have allergy and autoimmunity. So that's why we devote so much time to breastfeeding support. The other thing I think is really important in looking at a timeline is to look at the frequency of prescription medications, especially PPIs or antacids early on, especially multiple antibiotics, especially recurring steroid doses for kids that have a lot of asthma exacerbations. So the medication history in childhood, I think, is crucial.
I would also, for adults, look for any traumatic childhood experiences. So, for example, um, a lot of people now are adopting children from Russia or Romania or uh, Korea where they may have attachment disorders that are a result of being in an orphanage and not being touched for the first few months of life. And even if those kids come to America and get, you know, nice homes and a loving family and good nutrition, um, that is something that is sort of psychologically imprinted and can have really long-term effects into adulthood. I also would look at family history of uh, different illnesses that run in the family, especially looking for the themes of things that are either autoimmune or chronic inflammation or mental health issues. I think all of those have important bearings um, on your life as an adult. And so when you look at all that, one of the themes that often emerges, if you can't think of other things to do, is to treat oxidative stress and to do things that are anti-inflammatory because there's so many different um, conditions that will benefit from those types of interventions that you, it's almost like you don't have to have exact diagnostic specificity. So those are my ideas about carrying forward to the adult world. Yeah, absolutely. We always talk about pattern recognition in functional mm -hmm. medicine. And I'm wondering if when we're thinking about, you mentioned family history, but in terms of the microbiome specifically, do you see patterns in families, for example, with siblings, that multiple siblings in a family might have gut dysfunction. We know that everything is individualized and that each individual re will respond different, differently to things like stressors and antibiotic exposure and, and dietary exposures. But is, the, is that something you see commonly? Yeah. So I would say that when we're giving a food intervention or a diet change to a family, we really try to have the other siblings make the same changes. So it's really not fair to have little Johnny, you know, eating broccoli and Brussels sprouts and his sisters having cupcakes all day. And typically um, kids parents feed all their kids pretty similarly. So, you know, there may be some changes, but um, usually the whole family uh, can benefit. Um, if both parents are obese or have eating disorders, that makes it an order of magnitude harder to do things. We'll often see um, patterns like, for example, um, one of the things that people are always surprised to find out about are uh, kids that have phenol sensitivities and cannot break down things like bananas and uh, red grapes and red cherries and their behavior goes berserk. And um, we will say, you know, think about what your child ate before this behavior went berserk. You know, could it be that it had high phenols or high salicylates? And often we'll have several kids in the family that can't tolerate salicylates or phenols. So the patterns do emerge. And um, again, we're not, you know, we have an identified patient, but really our the people we're working with is a whole family and that should ideally include the siblings. Yeah, that's great. From a practice, a practice implementation standpoint, once you have identified that a patient needs some support with their microbiome, you initiate treatment. And so with pediatric patients, what does the follow-up schedule look like? Are you giving, you know, all of your educational materials and your supplements and then kind of setting them free? Or what's the follow-up schedule? How long do you anticipate it will be before they see improvements in things like behavior? So, you know, as in all functional medicine, it's all individualized. But as yeah. a general rule, I would say that at, at the first visit, when I have all the information in front of me and I'm thinking through the timeline and the matrix, that's when I feel like I know the most about what I want to do for this kid. And so I'll often write a lot of that down. But over the years, we've learned that just because I thought of it doesn't mean we should do it 
at the first visit. So we actually try to pick three interventions at the first visit and then do a follow-up, which can either be by phone or telemedicine or in person, depending on if the patient traveled to see us, uh, somewhere in the one month to three month range. Um, if we get the idea that they're gonna have trouble implementing um, our recommendations, we err on the side of doing it earlier. If they have financial constraints and we feel like they understand or, and are gonna be able to keep going without support, then may maybe we would do it in about three months. And one of our biggest successes in getting people to do what we say is when they do follow up, we always look for something to compliment them on that they were able to do and use phrases like, you know, it's harder to change what you feed your kid. Uh, it, it's harder to change that diet than it is to change the religion. So getting him or her to eat broccoli was huge or, you know, and I realize I gave you a lot to do. It's hard for anybody to take a supplement every day. It looks like you really did a nice job with that. So those kinds of things are helpful. Dr. Mumper, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today and sharing your insights about the pediatric microbiome and tools and insights, how we can create and build healthy adults. We really appreciate all of your time and it's just been a joy to talk with you. Thanks, I really enjoyed it too, thanks. To hear more from Dr. Mumper on the pediatric microbiome, see the links in our show notes for more interviews and presentations. To join the conversation on this topic, visit IFM's pages on Facebook and Instagram. For more information about functional medicine, visit IFM.org.